it's every it's everything it's everything i do is for that it's everything we all do here for that like and you have to believe there's no sense in being like no this isn't our year like hell yeah this is our year and you got to believe it deep and i think we all do so one of these years man it's got to be us first of all this is my voice i'm tim green and i have als this podcast is not about als or living with disabilities i don't want you to feel sorry for me I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Charlie McAvoy, welcome to our podcast. We really appreciate your time, especially this close to the NHL season. For our listeners outside of the Boston area or those who don't follow the NHL, Charlie is an alternate captain and the top defenseman for the Boston Bruins. He is generally considered one of the top defensemen in the league and also signed a record-breaking contract in 2022. Charlie, I am so happy you could join us today. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be on. It'll be a good time. Let's start out with some advice you would give to parents, like Troy, who's got a three-year-old who is already on skates with an affinity for hockey. You also recently married the daughter of the <laughs> Pittsburgh Penguins head coach. So one day when you have kids of your own, they won't have much of a choice. They'll practically be born on skates. It's funny to look back at that now and have you know, certainly a different kind of look, um, you know, or perspective on, on hockey parenting altogether. Um, cause I know that my, my dad specifically, he was, he was the guy, he was the one who played a little bit. He played up until high school and that was as far as it took him, but he was always a great player. And, um, you know, he was more of the hands-on one, the one who got me into the game and, you know, and, and I obviously fell in love with it, but he was certainly the one that, that held me to a high standard. And, and wanted the best for me and, you know, was always trying to find, you know, new things to, to put on me ways that he thought I could be better. Um, you know, and I'm appreciative for all those things. And I think I could say that during it, I, I definitely wasn't, <laughs> I just wanted to go hang out and like, you know, I wanted to go play with my friends. I wanted it to be normal. I wanted to have my weekends to go do all these things. And like in, in hockey, that's not realistic, especially if you're playing like, you know, travel hockey, you're going to be on the road a lot. Um, you're going to be doing all these things, but uh, you know, looking back, I wouldn't have changed the thing. And I think I would have had a little bit more um, appreciation for, for all the hard work that he put in that ultimately allowed me to, to achieve my dream. So what advice would you give me? I literally have a, my three-year-old at this, at this point, three-year-old son. We actually just yeah. got back from skating yesterday. We were there yesterday. Okay. What advice? Because yeah. I, I assume people listening. I know we have uh, one of the listeners who reached out to me about the the episode that we did with Foxy and said to ask what advice we would have given. I said, "Oh, it's, we'll pass it down to Charlie." <laughs> pass it, pass it to me. Yeah, it's something that I've thought about a little bit. Um, you know, in my own life, you know, when when you know, God willing, I come across the the time when I get to be a hockey parent. Um, I think I would just try my best to just steer, steer them on a path. Right. And then you kind of just want to let them fall in love with it themselves. Um, you know, that there has to be a certain joy and love that they have for it or else they'll never be able to, to really reach any level or, or grow in the sport. Um, you know, so I think you bring it to them in, in a way that they can fall in love with it and reasons that, you know, for their own reasons, you know, whether it's be having him meet Adam and now Adam is his, his, the, the coolest guy he's ever met. Right. And then like, he, that's his way of falling in love with the game, you know, and certain things like that, like uh, unique things that, that allow them to always come back to the sport. Cause at the heart of it, you have to love it. You have to love it. If it's going to be something you're doing from three until 
you know, college or whatever, how far it takes you, like, you'll want to invest in it. You'll want to put the work in if the foundation of the sport, especially at three, like, you don't know, I'm not going to be telling you to go do rope ladder and stuff. Like they just need to, at this foundational level, get them on the ice, allow them to skate and allow them to just fall in love with the game. The problem that would happen, Charlie, is we went to a Rangers game and we talked to Adam before the game. And then in that game, he went to the penalty box. And so now <laughs> my son thinks that's so like we go out and we do skating. He's like, if I do good today, can I go sit in the penalty box? Like that's his. Can I go sit in the box? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'll never forget. We used to have the penalty box and that was where my, when, when my babysitter would come over myself and my three siblings. She would put me in the penalty box when I was bad. It was literally like a cushioned off section next to the couch. <laughs> she'd put up the cushions and I'd, she'd put me in the box whenever I was bad. I have to serve my little penalty. Oh, man. How about a parent who has a kid in middle or high school and they think they want to play hockey in college? What would you tell the kid or their parents? Okay. So for the player, this is... Now you're at the age group where, where now you can start to separate yourself. Like now this is sort of, you know, this is, this is high school, right? This is middle school. Like now you get to decide for yourself and obviously your parents can be influential in this, but what do you want to do with your, with your spare time? Right? Like, do you want to be, you know, out and about on the weekends and that's sort of like a cliche or whatever you're going to parties or hanging out and doing all this stuff or, or do you want to be focused? on what means the most to you. And, and that was, I had a little bit of both worlds, which was great. I definitely have some memories of hanging out with my friends when I could, but for the most part, it was mostly hockey that really dominated my schedule. And it was good two ways where I was really focused on wanting to get better. So that was all the extra things that I could be doing. I was doing. And then two, it really kept me out of trouble. <laughs> like You don't really have these opportunities to, you know, to be, to be out and about doing stuff that I probably shouldn't have been doing anyway. So I was on a steer path and I definitely can thank my parents for that because they kept me focused. Um, but the one thing I will say about parenting that especially I remember at that age was my dad specifically went from sort of the, that, that overbearing hockey parent who's, you know, watching practice and every game and everything. And, you know, he always has his two cents, right? Like, what I could be doing better or this, that sort of like getting like a little bit of like a stale voice in my head. And I'll never forget that ninth grade year I played for a junior hockey team, the New Jersey Rockets. And the first thing that the coach did was said, there's, there's no parents allowed at practice. There's no parents allowed in the room. There's no parents allowed anywhere. Like you can come to the games and support, but after the game, your son's getting on the bus and he's coming back with us. Like, and I just remember that that was sort of a, a year where like he was able to just sort of enjoy it from afar now knowing like, okay, he's in, he's in good hands. Like, and, and that was such a great year. And for me, for hockey, for, for the both of us in our relationship really was when he almost took a back seat because he entrusted in the coaches and everybody and, and in myself that, you know, I've shown that I want to do this. I'm doing the right things. Like it's almost a little bit of when you can get out of the way and remove yourself, like then they can really take off and find it for themselves. That's great. Kind of, it kind of got you to the point and then let you go. Yeah, exactly. And obviously a lot of that is the trust in the coach. You know, you have to trust in the coach and the strength coach and all those things and all the people that you're surrounding your son with. Like, Hey, I'm passing him off to you and I'm trusting in you now for his development. And we were lucky that we had, you know, a coach that was really good that we believed in. And, and he was ultimately who got me to the next level. It's so hard whenever, like when we talk to Adam on the podcast and we talk to him off the podcast about anything with hockey recruiting is just so like the billet family and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, I know. I know. So crazy. It's a lot of buzzwords that not many people understand. <laughs> yeah. It's so normal in the hockey world, but outside of the hockey world, like when I hear it, you know, I, I, know. I, I was talking to uh, my wife, Adam and my sister, Tay, we were all hanging out. And uh, Adam was like, yeah, so, you know, your, your kid leaves and you're like 16, 17, they leave the house and go. And my wife's like, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We have no one even close. I said it. Our oldest is I five. I literally said it. Oh, yeah, you're already talking about when they're going to be leaving <laughs> to, go, to go, yeah, go abroad, go play hockey. I literally said it today to someone because my billet brother is coming to town to, on Friday and I'm taking him to the BC Michigan State football game here in Boston. He's a Michigan State alumni. so. I'm like, yeah, my billet brother's coming. They're like, you're, you're who? 
you're what? <laughs> like, no, I'm like, oh, I've got geez, my brother, my brother's yeah. coming. <laughs> yeah. You grew up with three sisters. Did they play hockey too? When you eventually have kids of your own, would you encourage both your boys and girls to play? Yeah. So growing up, we all played hockey. Yep. And it was a little bit of like circling back um, to kind of falling in, in love with the game. Um, my youngest sister, Heather, she plays hockey at St. Anselm. She's going to be a senior this year. So this is her last year. They played division one. It's been fun. It's right in New Hampshire. So I've gotten to go see her. And then my older sister, Kayla, she played hockey until she was about 15. And now she works obviously with, uh, with Adam at the Rangers as an assistant strength coach. Uh, and then my youngest sister, Holly, so Heather's at St. Anselm's Holly. She was the one who, who gave it a go when she was young and it wasn't really for her. So I think I would do the same exact thing. I think you kind of spelled it out for me. I don't know if I have a choice with the background that we have. So I think we'll get everybody on skates and we'll give them all a chance to, you know, to, to play and fall in love and, and give them everything that we can to help. And, um, you know, obviously you hope they take to it, but yeah, yeah. I'd be more than happy to have all my kids play hockey. That would be amazing. And then there's the junior hockey leagues in places like Minnesota and Michigan, where you have to leave your family at age 16 and live with a host family. If you get into a program like that, is it a foregone conclusion that you will one day be drafted into the NHL? For the most part, I feel like the numbers are staggering how well that the, the USA, uh, the NTDP, the National Team Development Program is for producing players and really NHL players. Um, I was so fortunate to, to be a part of that. Um, it was something that we weren't really planning on. It, it kind of came to us late and we got a chance to, I got a chance to go try out and ultimately made the team. And I remember you're so ecstatic in one second. And then the next you're like, Oh my God, I'm, this means I'm leaving, I'm leaving home. And I remember that was particularly difficult. My mom, I don't think she was ready for me to leave, but then I guess I don't know. I'm sure every mom's not ready for their, for their son to leave or anyone. Uh, but it's, it's such an amazing place to, to really develop. Um, you make friends for a lifetime. You're going to high school, you're in class together, and then you're at the rink for four or five hours a day. The skates are better because you're playing against the best players. The workouts are great. You're surrounded by, you know, elite staff. Um, and then ultimately what that produces is, is great teams. And we were able to win some gold medals along the way. Um, I won one with Adam and a lot of the guys on that team were, were us NTDP guys. And then ultimately, yeah, guys, a lot of guys getting drafted the majority of the team. We had a really special group our 1997 year. Um, I might even be selling it short, but I think we have like 13 or 14 guys that have played in the NHL. Um, you know, which on a 20 person team is, <laughs> that's pretty good. What's, what's that conversation like with, with your, with your parents or what, were they thinking pros or were you just saying, let's try this out to get into the best college or what was that like? Oh, it went, it went very quickly from, okay. That year I had gotten some interest from some schools. Um, <laughs> Harvard was one of them. They were the first and then. I had UMass Amherst and a, and a couple others that came along and we were like, holy, like, like I might be able to get college paid for it. Like, this is a big deal for my family. Um, and that was, that was pretty much like, this is amazing. And then when that happened, the shift in, in goals of like, okay, now I'm amongst the elite here and look at the guys that have come through this program, whether it's like, you know, Patrick Kane and, and I don't even know, Seth Jones, Jack Johnson, all these guys, you see them up on the wall when you're there and it's all some of the best players in the NHL. And it just like a, like a flick of switch. I was like, okay, if I'm here, like this could be me now too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then once you get there, they, they're, they're really good about telling you, you know, nothing, nothing's given to you. You have to go and earn it. And, uh, and that's really what it was there. It was a great environment to, to be in, to develop. And, and yeah, really amazing memories being there. How likely is it that an American kid will get drafted or have a career in the NHL if they don't go through this development program? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think, um, you know, 
good hockey players come from everywhere. Great hockey players come from everywhere and, and they will find you. And that is one of the biggest things. And I know if we're talking to parents directly, like everyone's path is different and some guys will reach certain heights earlier than, than you. And that's okay. Because in those ages of like 13 to, to 21, there's so much changing in like your body guys are going through puberty at different times. Like, you know, maybe you haven't found like the training habits yet. Like maybe you haven't hit your growth spurt yet. There's so many different factors that play into like early bloomers versus late bloomers. And you see guys all the time who come out of places you would never believe that are some of the best players. Um, I think one of the best things about that, and you can see it because the numbers are really good is uh is undrafted college free agents and there are so many of them in the nhl and that's a route where you were a late bloomer you went to college you didn't get drafted most likely you showed up there at at 21 playing junior hockey as long as you could before they kicked you out of the league and then you go to school and you develop from 21 to 25 and the next thing you know you're playing in the nhl And it happens every single year. You see these guys and they come in and they make impacts. And those are guys that didn't go to the, to the program. There's guys from everywhere from the USHL, the NHL, um, Minnesota high school kids who, who play high school until college, like good hockey players can come from everywhere. It certainly isn't a, a a death sentence. If you don't make the, the program, it's just a path that, is special and and one that I always encourage to people if you get the chance to do it to uh, to do it to send your son there. I want to go back to your childhood, Charlie. Growing up, you played with Adam Fox, who we spoke with in episode twenty six. How many years did you two guys play together? <laughs> Too many years. <laughs> I played <laughs> I played with Adam. Oh man, I don't even know because I was so young when I first met Adam. Um, I want to say maybe we were like five or six uh i was playing for long beach um and i think he was might have already been playing for the gulls that was when i met mike brocco our coach and he was like you got to come play with us and uh and then i played with adam all the way up until you know so maybe seven to to 12 we split up for for a couple of years and then played one last year together uh of u14 so six seven years maybe hanging around hanging out with him and andrew <laughs> in fact, you and I first met at my daughter Tate and Adam's wedding this summer. So that is a testament to your guys' enduring friendship. Yeah, it's really special. I think I'm huh. what an amazing wedding, by the way, first off. But to and I and I see this more and more prevalent as I've grown up. Like it is so hard to really keep contact with people and, and life is just so crazy and um you know, he's one of those special people where I guess, yeah, our relationship it tested to the, stood the test of time. We, we have so many of these memories together. And then, you know, I got to, uh, to play with him again for world junior. We spent some time in Ann Arbor and then, you know, you sort of separate and break up and you, you go down these different roads, but it was always like when we shoot each other a text, like we never missed a beat. Um, you know, and those are the ones that are really special. And, um, you know, for him to be there when I got married and then to, to see him get married. Now we're entering this, this new level of our, uh, you know, growing up and our friendship. And I can't wait. I can't tell you how excited I am to get to play with him, uh, play with him again for four nations. And we can finally hang out for a little longer than just a day. At the wedding, you told me that you played football as a kid and that it was hard to give up. You'd have made a heck of a linebacker (laughs) if you want to be in the NHL or even a collegiate hockey player. Do you think kids have to give up other sports? Yeah, no, this is one that I actually am pretty passionate about. Like, and I've had this asked to me before. So growing up, like I loved football and I played running back and linebacker. And like to this day, football is still far and away my, my favorite sport besides hockey. Um, I had so much fun with it and I had to give it up in middle school. Cause now was the time to play middle school football and the practice and the games and, and all that, like it, it, they weren't very lenient anymore about missing practice. It was, it was sort of like you were getting to a, a different tier in middle school. They start taking it a little more serious, like, and as you climb that ladder. So 
I gave up football in middle school in sixth grade. Um, but I, mostly because it was directly in season with hockey. So I had games every single weekend, the same time that you'd have a football game. There was times before that where I remember going right from, right from hockey to football or vice versa. Um, but I was able to play a lot of sports outside of hockey season. And I did that all the way up until high school. So, you know, baseball, I played soccer, I played lacrosse. Lacrosse was the one that I played the most and I stuck with. I really enjoyed lacrosse. Long Island is certainly a lacrosse hotbed. Um, everybody plays it. I had a lot of friends that played collegiately. Um, it's, it's great. It was a way for me playing travel hockey to also play sports with my best friends that I grew up with. And that was playing Long Beach lacrosse for me. So I remember kind of having that debate in ninth grade, um, you know, where I kind of found out early on that it, they weren't going to be very lenient about me missing practice. And I knew, you know, if you miss practice, you can't play in games and, and all that. So it was like, okay, this is finally the decision time for me to, to really just focus on hockey, um, you know, which was fine. But I guess circling back, what I see now more is like parents giving up Sports are encouraging just focusing on one sport. I really don't think that's that's great. Like, I think you should give your child the opportunity to play every sport for as long as they can. I think, one, you're creating a better athlete. Two, you're allowing them to do something like what I did, play with their friends, play on different teams, make more friends, make more memories, and find, you know, which route you like the best, what sport you like the best. And when I hear you know, now that people are focusing on hockey right away, they're not playing anything else. They're just going to be, you know, a super, super hockey player. Like, I think that that can perhaps do more damage than good in the form of possibly burning out or, you know, losing your drive for it because you didn't have another route, you know, of energy or joy or something else. So I would, I would say adamantly to, to play sports, multiple sports as long as you can. You were a Rangers fan growing up, even though you were surrounded by Islanders fans because your dad's family business had clients who played for the Rangers. Did he ever take you to meet any of those players? I assume the players' houses were on the water. Did you ever say to yourself, this is going to be me someday? And do you own a place on the water now? So growing up, it was in the 1970s, I think. So this is my dad's childhood. The New York Rangers used to practice in Long Beach. So that's my hometown. That's where I was born and raised. Uh, across the street from him, he had Jean Rattel, who is a legend. And then he had John Ferguson Sr. Um, so I guess two stories. Uh, both circling back to my time with the Bruins. So I get drafted, uh, 2016, um, you know, and John Ferguson Jr., now all grown up, just like my dad, is uh, he's the assistant GM for the Boston Bruins. So we go upstairs and, and you're meeting everybody, uh, bring my whole family up after there. And like my dad, seeing him interact with John Ferguson Jr. was one of the coolest things I'd seen. You know, they hadn't seen each other since they were just little kids. And, and it was so cool, like hearing them just go over some of the stuff from their childhood, which was so awesome. And then, uh, gentleman John Rattel, I met him in Boston. Um, I met him last year at the hundredth year. Uh, they did the centennial for the Bruins, and he played for the Bruins for a little. And when I told him who I was and that I grew up in Long Beach, like seeing him perk up, and he remembered my grandfather right away, McAvoy Plumbing and Heating. It was, it was the coolest thing. Like this tied me back to, you know, I never met my, my grandfather and like hearing stories about him through, through these NHL legends. Like I just thought it was the coolest thing. Um, and ultimately since, uh, since I've left home, since I'm living in Boston now, I still go back to Long Island and see my, my family all the time. We still live in Long Beach and, uh, and I was able to, to help my parents, we we moved out of our childhood house, and I got them a new home. Um, they're not directly on the water. Sorry, mom and dad, but they're three houses <laughs> in, so it all worked out like a like a movie movie script. Yeah. What was that like? Too good to be true. Oh, that was the coolest thing ever. Like, 
It was amazing. My dad's my dad's MacBook Plumbing and Heating, so it's family owned for three generations. Um, he still works every day. I wish like hell I could retire him. I don't even know if he'd want me to because I don't know what he would do with himself if he didn't have that. Uh, but I knew growing up like this is my dream. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it to the NHL. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna buy mom and dad a house. And they won't have to worry. And like when you actually get to do that. I can't, I can't even explain to you what, like what it feels like to be able to do that. It was just incredible, really. Like, I don't have the words for it, what, what it meant to, you know, the three of us to share that moment. That's such a great story. I know your parents must be very proud. So you ended up committing to Boston University in 2013. Did you consider any other colleges or did you know it was BU right away? Yeah, I did. It was that entire process is really cool getting to go see schools and, and, you know, seeing different campuses and it's unique and, you know, I loved every second of it. Um, so like I said, I went to, to Harvard, um, BU, um, Yale, Cornell, I had a, a big ECAC, uh, flair in there. And what I ended up coming down to my last, my last four, it was Northeastern BU, um, and then Cornell and Yale. Um, so it was kind of two different paths, hockey East versus ECAC. Uh, obviously the the academics, I know, you know, Yale and Cornell are more prestigious than BU. Um, BU is nothing to sneeze at. It's a great school. Uh, but for me, there was a lot of things that I thought in Boston, I fell in love with, um, the campus I loved. I love the city feel of it. And then probably the, the biggest thing was, was the coaches. Um, and David Quinn was the coach when I was there and he was someone with an NHL background and BU had a lot of guys, um, you know, a lot of alumni, a lot of NHL presence. Uh, and I sort of went there with the understanding like, okay, like I'm, I'm prioritizing hockey a little bit with this decision. Um, you know, because I, I want to go to the NHL and that's my dream. And I think here is the place where I can get the best development, where I can also get a great education. Um, but I believe in this guy right here. I believe in David Quinn. I believe in these facilities and these strength coaches. Like this is where I'm going to go, where I can develop and go to the next level. And, um, you know, it worked out even better than I could have hoped for. We had, we didn't win as many trophies as I wish we did. Uh, but I have friends for life and great memories and, and we did win a lot of games. We had a lot of good teams. Uh, so we did enjoy it. Yeah. More important than the academics. You met your wife at BU. How did you meet? Yeah. So I met Kylie, uh, my freshman year. Um, I had a, a friend on the team who was talking to one of her roommates, friends, uh, some, one of those, you know, a couple degrees of separation and they were all hanging out and, uh, we all ended up in the same group one time and I remembered her and, and, you know, we ended up getting together and connecting and obviously like, like, a the new school that we are, I was Instagram and that was how we touched base. Uh, and that was how I shot my shot and, uh, and it went perfect. Um, we ended up texting back and forth and, uh, and then we ended up meeting on Halloween. We, we played Denver that day and we beat them and it was like a big win. And then we all dressed up as, uh, average Joe's from the movie dodgeball. <laughs> and I was Steve the pirate. So I had the eye patch on and everything. And, uh, and we ended up meeting out at a party. I knew where she was going. And I said that I'd be there at some point. And, and I, I ran right there. It was the first place I went and she was dressed as a mermaid and the rest is history. Steve the pirate um, and mermaid. Steve the pirate. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, um, you know, and this is such a cool story too for her dad, but uh so obviously Mike Sullivan, um he was coaching in Wilkesbury at the time when we first met. And I remember I went to World Juniors that year and we just just started dating. We were like, let's do the whole boyfriend girlfriend thing. And um I wanna say it was while I was gone that Pittsburgh moved on from uh, from their coach. I think it was Mike Johnson at the time. And then Sully gets hired. They bring him right up from Wilkesbury, and now he's coaching for the Penguins. And you know that was so cool for him. And then you fast forward five months, and they win the Stanley Cup. Fast forward another twelve months, and they did it again. He won back to back. 
it, it was really amazing. You know, his, his story was, was incredible. And what he's still doing there is, is really great. Did you know who her dad was when you two first started talking? I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. When we first, when we first started texting, uh, I found out pretty quick and I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> this is my draft year. She's, uh, you know, her dad's coaching in Wilkesbury. Um, I knew, I knew right away. I think I slid in a little like, Oh, you get me drafted to Pittsburgh or something like that. <laughs> in 2016, you were drafted in the first round with the 14th overall pick. Was it a surreal moment for you or did you have an idea of where you would get drafted and when? The draft experience was definitely a surreal moment. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of the things that I remember from it, just being surrounded by my family was, was the coolest thing. Um, I had my whole mom's side of the family from Virginia come up. I had some of my dad's side come. So I had family everywhere and just sharing that moment with them was was by far and away the the coolest part about it and some of the pictures we had of it um i remember the draft itself being pretty stressful uh i like you just wanted to get drafted as high as you could right because that was your validation like okay i'm i'm the number one overall pick all the way down just getting drafted like high so i remember looking at teams and i'm like okay at eight like i interviewed good with buffalo maybe you know we'll see there um you know, and, and so on all the way down the list. And I remember there was a bunch of teams where I'm like, oh, like they might take me. I don't know. I think we had a good interview, a good stuff. They need a D like, and it just kept kind of getting passed over, getting passed over, getting passed over. And then we got to Boston and I was like, come on, like, this is too good to be true. Like Boston has to take me. <laughs> and uh, I just remember that being a pretty stressful 10 minutes waiting for that one to come through. Um, and then ultimately to find out and, and looking at it, you know, with, with hindsight, like I could not have dreamed of a better place to be. Um, obviously what Boston means to me from BU to my wife being from here to this being where we met to carrying it on to, to the Bruins, you know, I got to play for the Bruins while Kylie was finishing her degree at BU and then going to nursing school. Like if I'm in Winnipeg or wherever the heck I am, like, you know, those are things that you wouldn't get to see. Um, our path, our journey has been, amazing and, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that I was able to stay in Boston. I've been a part of some really good teams. We've gotten really close and um, you know, I think we're still just getting better and uh, I couldn't ask for a better place to be. Did you know going into the draft? I mean, you obviously if you're taking the first round, you had, you had, you knew you were probably going to get drafted, but did you think you were going that high? I thought, I really thought, I thought maybe at Buffalo uh, at eight, I think, Colorado had 10. I thought maybe, I want to say Jersey had 11. I thought there was a chance. Carolina had 13, and they took a different defenseman right before me. Um, there was just a bunch of different places where I was like, oh, this might be it. This might be it. Like, I think it could be. And then, like, in hindsight, I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you know, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And I ended up in the perfect landing place, and – and, you know, everything that's evolved from, from that, all the, the things that have fallen into place from that decision, it just, you know, it, it's been incredible, really. Getting drafted that high in, in, in the NHL, did you have a really good college year, a really good couple of college years? Or is it, is it like a one, if you have one amazing year, do you get drafted? Or is it kind of a slow build up until that point? Huh, I think it's. Probably a little bit like kind of like I'm trying to think of it in NFL terms or something like you kind of get a little bit of like watch list, right? So it's like, okay, this guy is draft eligible next year. Like, you know, he, he was good. I think this guy could be an, an A rated prospect. You know, these guys are B rated prospects. These guys are C rated prospects. And you always see people, you know, climb or fall depending on how they play in their draft year. So I think going into the year, I had, I had an A, an a grade. I had the December birthday on my side. So the, the draft cutoff is September 15th. So I was in 1997 getting drafted with a, with majority 1998s. So I was one of the older guys in the draft and that helped. Um, so I had all those things going into the year. And I remember thinking, you know, like, don't be satisfied with any of that, you know, preseason stuff, like all that. And Quinny was, was great. He was the best person to be surrounded by my coach at BU. 
because he kept reminding me that none of it mattered. None of it mattered. Like just go out and play and don't think about it, which is easier said than done. But I knew that if I just took care of business and I kept doing all the right things that, you know, I should be able to, to see this through and, and, you know, even elevate on where I was. And, you know, that was ultimately what happened. I'm sure though, like you said, it's easier said than done. You probably had those thoughts while you're playing you have a good oh, game, you have a bad every game. game. Yeah. Every game you're like, oh man, you're trying to force so much stuff, like trying to make that highlight <laughs> real play. Like you just need to just play your game. That's it. About two months into your career with the Boston Bruins, you had what must have been a life altering scare. As you know, I had a health scare of my own that turned into a full fledged nightmare. I was blessed to have the shell of Christian faith that I could use to revitalize and regenerate, which allowed me to realize that my condition was actually a blessing. I think that God was providing me with an opportunity to rededicate my life to God and his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I saw that you were wearing a cross at the wedding. Do you have a faith in God that helped you through that time? But why don't you start by telling us about the scare? I had, I think we were referring to, I had, uh, I had SVT. Um, so it's super ventricular tachycardia. Um, so I had these kind of like these scares along the way when I was playing hockey, it would be times where if you think about, uh, you know, the pulses that you send in your heart, <clears throat> they're supposed to be one way streets. So essentially I had a two way street where like the pulse would sometimes go and just turn around, keep, keep going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And that would make my heart beat like crazy. Uh, so that was kind of scary. They would always come and go. Um, and then it was in my first year. Yeah. Pretty early on where I had one and it was pretty bad. It took a really long time for it to stop. Um, and that was finally when, when the Bruins, uh, and they sort of handled it different than, than every other step along the way. They were like, you're not getting on the ice again until we figure out what's going on. Um, so we went and did, uh, I, th literally the next day I'm, I'm over, um, with the cardiologist doing a stress test. He had me on the bike and then he had me on the treadmill doing all these things to try to, to try to make it go. Um, so they could see it again and diagnose it. And we didn't have any luck with that. So I kind of just based off me explaining it to them, they diagnosed it. Um, and I, um, so grateful for, for the team that we have and, and the healthcare that we have in, in, in Boston. Um, Dr. Baggish, it wasn't too long after that we scheduled it and we, we set up the surgery, um, you know, and they went in and, and it was really successful. You're actually awake for it the whole time, which is kind of wild. They <laughs> stick a catheter up your, yeah, you don't feel anything. I was on a lot of pain, like medicine and stuff. They, they're doing that and caffeine simultaneously. So your heart is like jumping out of your chest. And they had the intercom going. He's like, hey, like, we found it. Your heart's doing it. We're going to go ahead and take care of it. So they stick this catheter. It felt like they were sticking a garden hose up my groin. And they run it all the way to your heart. And uh, once they're once they're in there, then they, they, like, basically burn it. They cauterize it. So instead of your two lanes, they burn the one. And now you're back to just one lane traffic. And, I mean, the whole entire thing was, was crazy looking back on and, you know, it's been a while since I thought about it and how scary that was. Uh, I'm in my first year and I remember thinking like, what if this is something that I, that I can't play, that I can't come back from, that I can't play from, they're going to shut me down. I can't play anymore. Um, and that was terrifying. Um, I've been raised Catholic since I was a kid. My mom and dad, uh, you know, are both members of the church and I went to Catholic school up until middle school. Um, so we have a really good foundation of faith, um, myself and my wife, and and I rely on that for for everything, um, you know, really for everything in life. Uh, so I don't think that was something that I, I would have been able to handle really well, <laughs> along with a lot of things, just you know, on my own. Um, yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of times where you know most things always bring me back to to that. That was part of the deal, Charlie's he he wouldn't do the podcast unless he got to bring up Christianity every episode. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. You're gonna make my mom really happy. What was it like having 
the legendary Zudano Chara to play next to? How big was he? What was he like in the locker room? And did he teach you anything? He was as was he big? Oh, are you kidding me? I'm looking up on looking up to him. I think he had two heads on me. <laughs> he was so big. I'll never forget the first time we met him, and I came up to him, and I was like starstruck. Uh, you know, this this guy, he's damn near seven foot. He's a legend in the game, and this is my first day. I get called up, and I go up to him, and I'm like, "Mr. Chara, how's it going?" You know, my name's Charlie. He's like, "Nope, none of that." Like, yeah, I'm just Z. Call me Z. And I'll never forget. You know, from, from really from day one, from the moment I met him, you know, all the way up until, you know, he, he ended up leaving us to go to Washington. Um, he treated me like the like I was family to him. You know, and that really ended up setting the stage for what I found out to be was just the Bruins culture and what they've created. And, and Z was certainly, you know, one of the biggest people uh, in creating that. Uh, what did he, did he teach me? He taught me so much, um, you know, I think uh, about being responsible, about taking care of yourself, about holding yourself accountable, holding others accountable. His work ethic was still to this day. I've never seen anything like it. And and you see it daily. If if you see him on social media, he's still he's doing like triathlons and Ironmans now. And he when he should be sitting by a beach with a margarita, like he's earned that. But he was right back to okay, what am, what else can I do now that I'm going to go dominate? And that's just how he's hardwired. Uh, he's truly one of the most special people I've ever met. The kind of soul. Um, and he was someone who was so easy to learn from just by the way that he acted every day. And uh, all of it was genuine. He didn't have to go out of his way. He just, he kind of stood there took mental notes of everything that he was doing. Okay. Okay. I see what he's doing. Like, how can I emulate that? How can I try and, you know, learn from that, have that be my own thing? Yeah. It was, it was amazing. I owe a lot to him, you know, for setting the foundation for my career. That's such a great, you mentioned it earlier, like, a situation to go into to go in and have somebody like that to kind of mentor you what a what a perfect uh place yeah yeah definitely i didn't even elaborate on that like just another one of the reasons why boston was such an incredible place like that was definitely another big part of it in 2019 you got what must have seemed like a boatload of money paying you a whisker short of five million dollars a year only to have them turn around two years later and reward you with a new eight-year, $76 million contract, the entirety of it guaranteed. Do you like that everybody knows what you make as a source of pride? After all, no one handed it to you. You worked your tail off to get there, and the hard work is far from over. Your season is long and grueling. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's honestly surreal to look back on. Um, just some of the experiences that I've had. And, you know, I remember going through that process for the, for the bridge deal that I signed, um, the three, the three year deal. And then I remember going back to the table for, for the next one. And it's, it's, it's hard, like, cause you can't put a number on all the hours of, of stuff that you've worked, but that's about as close as you can to it. Um, I'll never forget that f the day that I signed that, and calling my my family and telling them about that and just knowing that i'll that with this i can take care of everyone everyone in my life everyone that i love we have means that we've never had before um and it was sort of just seeing all the hard work everything that we've gone through thinking back on every little memory like to when you reach that point um you know it certainly is it's incredible what that felt like. And then you go and get mom and dad a house and, you know, you do all the things that you've dreamed of. Um, but then with it, you, you realize that it comes with a massive amount of responsibility because they're giving you that in good faith, knowing that, you know, you're going to be a cornerstone of this team and this franchise and you have to go out every single day and work for that and show that. And really there's not a day that I think about that money, but I'll tell you every day that I'm thinking about, okay, like what am I doing today to get better? 
and it doesn't really change anything. And I think that's, you know, what everybody would strive to have is that, you know, the money never changes you certainly as a person and who you are and your, your foundation and your morals, but especially your work ethic. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of, you know, how, how much I work. And I know that, you know, that money is nice, but it, I want success on the ice. I didn't mean to talk you into that answer because the downside is that everyone figures you've got money to burn and they are happy to help you burn it. What is the most <laughs> outrageous thing anyone has brought to you regarding money? You don't have to say who if you don't want to. You know what? Not many people have, have come to me uh, for stuff. And I think you hear like, I, I've heard all of these stories of people and it might be your best friend, right? Someone like that that comes with you. Hey, let's build a restaurant. Like, let's do this. Let's do that. And I think it's a, you know, a credit to the people that I surround myself with. And, and, you know, it's a small circle. Um, and it has been like that even before I was pro the people that I really let in. And when you let them in, you let them in with everything you got They're into your heart. And, and that circle of people, I don't think they'd care if I made $5 <laughs> or if I make what I make. Um, and I think it's, it's so special to be surrounded by, by people like that. Um, you know, but I will say that it has allowed to, to open up some opportunities to, to, to spread it, you know, certain places. And, you know, I think one of the cooler ones here in Boston, and if you ever come up here, there's this place, uh, it's called the tall ship in East Boston. So myself and a couple of teammates, you know, we went in on, on, uh, we invested in that. And it's a really cool property. I did the welcome drinks for my wedding there. It's right on the right on the Boston Harbor. You're overlooking the entire city, and it's beautiful. Um, so I think that's one of the coolest things I think that I've done with my money, besides just giving it all to my financial guy, letting him take care of it. Have you done anything with your money that was like kind of dumb, but you earned it? Whether it was like a something fun, like a car or a vacation, like did you any splurging? I've splurged on vacations and my, my wife is definitely the one who's like the, the, the frugal of the two of us. None of us are like dumb senders, but she always is like big on, no, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be doing that. And I'll be like, I work so hard all year and you do too. Like we're going on this vacation and yeah, like we're going to stay in, in the suite if we can, you know, like we're going to go because we can only do it once a year. And when we do it, I want it to be so special. So I'd say the vacations are probably the biggest thing that I, that I splurge the money on. Now I I try not to do it with clothes. (laughs) I try. I don't think I did it a little bit when I was younger. That might've been my, my dumb spending. I I bought things and I didn't wear them. I got to ask you the, the follow up then. What's the best vacation or your favorite one, one of your favorite vacations you've been on? Okay. Best one like was we went to Capri and that was where I ended up getting engaged to to Kylie there. Um, this was 20. So 2023, so 2022. So we went over there for, for Tuca Rask had his wedding in Lake Como. So we decided like, Hey, we're going to go over early. I kind of, you know, we had it planned. I had my part planned of what I was going to do. Um, so we went over to Capri first. We got there like four or five days early. We stayed there for four days. On the second day, we went on a boat tour, um, just a private private little boat, just the two of us. We went around the island. And when we got to the end, they have this rock. It's called like, uh, I think it's Fer- Ferriglione Rock. And if you like kiss underneath it, you're supposed to be, you know, happy, healthy together forever, right? So that was where I was like, there's no better place to, pop the question than right here. Uh, and that's, that's definitely by far my favorite vacation memory, what stands out the most. And then it doesn't hurt the Tuca's wedding in Lake Como was like the coolest thing in the entire world. <laughs> that was amazing too. So all in all, it was a great like eight or nine days, whatever we were gone. That's a great spot. My, my dad's late. Uh, there's a place, the boat ride over from Capri. You probably went through like Positano or somewhere like that. That's yeah. where my dad, my parents would go there every year for 20 something years. Oh, it's beautiful. I would go back in a second because I didn't get to go to Positano. I want to go there. I want to do like more on the Amalfi Coast, but it's unbelievable. Troy, tell Charlie about your wedding and the trip we took to Italy a few years ago. 
Yeah, well, I, I got so I got married in Ravello, Italy, which is like right next to the Amalfi Coast on the Amalfi Coast, and um, we, we we all went out there. Basically, it was like thirty of the people that are closest to me, right, and like my family and only a couple friends. And we all flew out there like I don't even know what it was. It felt like a long time. It was probably three or four days before the wedding. And we just had I mean, it was just incredible. And we went to we were in Positano. It's like a smaller town. It's, it's, it's actually when we when we went, it wasn't as busy as it normally is. And so you'd be like walking in the town and you would just see like I would be walking through the town. I wouldn't have any plans in my phone. on. I'd just be walking and I'd see like, you know, I hear laughing and I'd look over at some clothing store and two of my, you know, idiot buddies would be in there like haggling for, for Italian <laughs> clothes they're never going to wear again. Yeah. Or you like walk past a restaurant. I'd see like my parents are there eating. I just like walk in. It was, it was really, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. It, it's, yeah, it sounds amazing. I, I would love to go back. Oh, I got a plan for it for sure. It'd be an easy sell because Kylie loved it too. Like she loved Capri. So we would like. Yeah, that's such an easy sell. Eating the food there is just different. The taste and the quality. The food, yeah, the food there is just unreal. Oh, none of them get like, I don't know. Like you don't see fat people in Europe. Like I know. they don't have don't, poison. <laughs> like, even in Italy, they're eating like pasta and everything. And like they, they're all look very healthy. You're like, how? If I eat that over here, I'm going to be 10,000 pounds. They don't, yeah, they don't have poison in their food. You know what it is too? They yeah, have, they don't poison the food. Poison the food and they have moderation control. Like when I go there, <laughs> I order like three different meals. The guy's like, hey, no. Like, yeah, I did the same <laughs> thing. The lady on vacation where we went last, we were in Spain. The lady's like, no, too much. No, 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 too much. She That's literally called serious. us off. Tell Charlie the story about room 47. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were in... <laughs> When we were in uh, Italy, everyone was coming over to like the hotel. There's, we were all at a bunch of hotels. There's so many of us. And my parents' hotel was like on the, on the water. So everybody was going over to that hotel. And there was a group of people. I'm not saying names. There was a group of people yeah. <laughs> that, were, that were ordering like drinks and whatever, food and drinks. Oh. Whatever. And the person's like, oh, what, what, uh, what room is this on? And they're like, I think we're all just putting it on room 47, which was my parents' room. No one knew. They didn't even know who it was. I ran up the tab on you guys. Oh, and my, my God. And my parents were like, you know, they had no idea. You know, they had no idea. It was like people no. who, like friends of, you know, anyways. Yeah, it was hilarious. You get the bill. It's like three sheets instead <laughs> of one. What the hell is all this? They're like, who's in room 47? Like, oh, we're not sure. Put on room 47. <laughs> Charlie, in your hockey career, you're used to winning. In international competition, you went five for five on medals, two bronze and three gold. And recently, your Boston Bruins set an NHL record with 65 regular season wins, and you guys regularly make the playoffs. So what do you think you need to win a championship? Oh, I wish it was as easy as like, what's the what's the magic piece that we can slot in? Um, no, I... I we've we've been so good for so long and we're and every year it's it's tough and you know it in professional sports like things change you know guys move on you bring in new guys old guys leave you know or anything and you know we lost a lot of pieces to free agency this year but at the same time we we retained a lot and we went out and got some guys too um i can't explain how grateful i am to be on teams that are competitive to be on this team this organization Every year I've been able to play in the playoffs. I've had majority of the years where we're fighting for a, a, a president's trophy, you know, to be the best regular season team in the league. Um, our standards so high and, 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 you know, our culture so good. I think it's, it's just a matter of time. And I truly believe that, um, you know, if they say you need to learn how to lose to win, I've done that, <laughs> had my fair share. Uh, I think that I think we have everything we need in in our room, um, you know, and 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 in the playoffs, really, there's so many things you need. The biggest thing is luck. You need luck. You need the bounces on your side. You need you need to just have everything go your way. Really, it's it's got to be a perfect. Uh, it's just thing. Things have to just fall in your way, really. And then I remember that when we went to the finals in 2019 is everybody plays exceptional obviously 
but you get these bounces, you get these, these, these lucky plays, things that just happen where it's like, okay, you know, we were meant to win this. We're going to win this. Um, and you need it. And I think one of these years we're going to get it. We got to have it. You think, could this be your year? Yeah. I mean, I, I go into every year thinking it could be our year. Um, I truly believe it too, with what we have and, and how it stacks up and, you know, and, and how our culture really wins out, how, how successful we're able to be. Um, and I really think that we're entering into a little window here where we've kind of had some different players come in. So it's me and pasta, you know, it's Pav, it's Lynn Holm, it's Carlo. We're all sort of getting a little bit older and we're getting into our prime. So it's a new core of guys. And we've separated from like Bergy, Kretsch and Z. You know, and as the more things change, we hope the more they stay the same with our culture carrying on through, um, you know, the work ethic, um, the results, all the things that we need to, to put us in position. Um, I think we have everything we need to do it. I'm going to put you on the spot for this one. Okay. Top five NHL defensemen. You can't include yourself. Who would you, who would you put them? Top five NHL defensemen. I would say this is in no particular order, okay? Okay, deal. Okay. So Adam's on there. And then you got Kale McCarr, uh, Roman Yossi, Victor Hedman, and Quinn Hughes. That's my five. It's a good five. Yeah. <laughs> You got a little bit of everything in there. I mean, obviously, all all of them are so gifted offensively, but they all play differently. Like, I don't think you could look at one of them and say that they all that those two are the same. There's different ways to get it to get the job done, which is pretty cool. Like for a defenseman, they all are great at different little niche things. You know. You know, it's hilarious when uh, my I think my dad asked Adam about their chances of winning. He said, "You know, you have to learn to lose before you can learn to win." He said the exact <laughs> exact same thing. I've been told it too many times and I'm like, I'm sick of hearing it. I've done my losing. I've done my fair share. Let me in. Boston's such a cool place too. Like, I mean, it's the city of champions, right? So it's like you enter into this fraternity in, in by it's like you take your seat at the table when you win here because everybody's won before you. And it's like, what I wouldn't do to win here like to be a part of it to be a part of that fraternity like it's every it's everything it's everything i do is for that it's everything we all do here for that like and you have to believe there's no sense in being like no this isn't our year like hell yeah this is our year and you got to believe it deep and i think we all do so one of these years man it's got to be us that's that's the clip for the episode right there that's the teaser that's it (laughs) <laughs> last question do you have a touch of the typical hockey goon in you being the tough defensive hockey guy going around fighting <laughs> i do i shouldn't be fighting anymore i don't need to i i hurt my shoulder a couple of years ago i had to get shoulder like my rotator cuff done and uh i think i've only fought like once since then so but before that i had a bunch I definitely have a touch of goon in me. Um, and I, I really do. Like, I 100% attribute it to football growing up. Like, my like Ray Lewis was – I had my Ray Lewis jersey. And I wear it around school all the time. Like, it was so violent. And there was a part of me – like, I hope this isn't, like, twisted, but I loved that. Like, I loved the big hit. Like, and I tried to take that. Okay, if I can't play football anymore, I'm going to do it on the ice with skates on instead. Um, you know, and I still have that in my game and I can still do that. You know, there's times when you look for it, there's times when you don't, um, certainly trying to, (laughs) don't need to do it very often. Uh, but I can when I have to. Now on to our final word segment where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Um, marrying my wife. What is the biggest adversity you faced? Just all my injuries in, in, in hockey, whether long or short. What are you most excited about? Um, winning a Stanley Cup in Boston. 
The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? <laughs> no, I had a great time. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> awesome. Charlie, last thing, and I'll, I'll, uh, we can wrap up. At the end of every podcast, and this is how we got you on here, at the end of every podcast, we asked our guests, we didn't want the podcast to be just about sports or just about ALS or just about writing or whatever. Uh, we wanted to get a lot of different people, different backgrounds. So who are a couple of people that you know personally that you think we should try to get on the podcast? There's a lot of great guys in, in, in Boston that I would say, um, you know, between like Bergie and Z and just those guys being the ultimate leaders. But yeah, we, can, we can go any walk of life. Any walk of life. I mean, Zidane Chara, that's one of the – That's the, he's a great one. Everyone's uh, all- Zidane Chara would be a great one, yeah. Charlie McAvoy, you are a class act. I knew that within a few minutes of talking with you. Also, I never believed I'd be saying this, but I am now a Bruins fan except when you play the Rangers. Thank you for joining us today, and good luck this season. Thank you guys so much. Really, I had a great time. I appreciate you having me. Charlie, thanks so much for doing this, and good luck this season. Except unless you're playing the Rangers, good luck this season. (laughs) Yeah, right. My family's already split down the middle now, too, with my sister and me. So it's like, oh, we got you guys down the middle, too. (laughs) Barkley. Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.